The Ascent of Mount Carmel by St. John of the Cross Book 2, Chapter 22 Wherein is solved a difficulty, namely, why it is not lawful under the law of grace to ask anything of God by supernatural means, as it was under the old law. This solution is proved by a passage from St. Paul. Difficulties keep coming to our mind, and thus we cannot progress with the speed that we should desire. For as they occur to us, we are obliged of necessity to clear them up, so that the truth of this teaching may ever be plain and carry its full force. But there is always this advantage in these difficulties, that although they somewhat impede our progress, they serve nevertheless to make our intention the clearer and more explicit, as will be the case with the present one. In the previous chapter we said that it is not the will of God that souls should desire to receive anything distinctly by supernatural means, through visions, locutions, etc. Further, we saw in the same chapter, and deduced from the testimonies which were there brought forward from Scripture, that such communion with God was employed in the old law and was lawful, and that not only was it lawful, but God commanded it. And when they used not this opportunity, God reproved them, as is to be said in Isaiah, where God reproves the children of Israel because they desired to go down to Egypt without first inquiring of him, saying, Et os meum non interrogastis, that is, ye ask not first at my own mouth what was fitting. And likewise we read in Joshua that when the children of Israel themselves are deceived by the Gabaonites, the Holy Spirit reproves them for this fault, saying, Suscheperunt ergo des chibarii seorum, et os domini non interrog interrogaverunt, which signifies, they took of their food, and they inquired not at the mouth of God. Furthermore, we see in the divine scripture that Moses always inquired of God, as did King David and all the kings of Israel with regard to their wars and necessities and the priests and prophets of old. And God answered and spoke with them and was not wroth, and it was well done. And if they did not do it, it would be ill done. And this is the truth. Why then, in the new law, the law of grace, may it not now be as it was aforetime? To this it must be replied that the pr principal reason why, in the law of Scripture, the inquirers inquiries that were made of God were lawful, and why it was fitting that prophets and priests should seek visions and revelations of God, was because at that time faith had no firm foundation, neither was the law of the gospel established, and thus it was needful that all men should inquire, that men should inquire of God, and that he should speak, whether by words or by visions and revelations, or whether by figures and similitudes, or by many other ways of expressing his meaning. For all that he answered and spoke and revealed belong to the mysteries of our faith, and things touching it or leading to it. And since the things of faith are not of man, but come from the mouth of God himself, God himself reproved them because they inquired not at his mouth in their affairs so that he might answer, and might direct their affairs and happenings towards the faith, of which at that time they had no knowledge, because it was not yet founded. But now that the faith is founded in Christ, and in this era of grace, the law of the gospel has been made manifest. There is no reason to inquire of him in that manner, nor for him to speak or to answer as he did then. For in giving us as he did, his son, which is his word, and he has no other. He spoke to us all together, once and for all, in this single word, and he has no occasion to speak further. And this is the sense of that passage with which St. Paul begins, when he tries to persuade the Hebrews that they should abandon those first manners and ways of converse with God, which are in the law of Moses, and should set their eyes on Christ alone, saying, Multifariam, multisque, modis olim, 
Deus loquens patribus in prophetis, novissime autem diebus, istis locutus est nobis in filio. And this is as though he had said, that which God spoke of old in the prophets to our fathers, in sundry ways, in diverse manners, he has now at last in these days spoken to us once and for all in the Son. Herein the de apostle declares that God has become, as it were, dumb, and has no more to say, since that which he spoke before aforetime in part to the prophets, he has now spoken altogether in him, giving us the all which is his Son. Wherefore, he that would now inquire of God, or seek any vision or revelation, would not only be acting foolishly, but would be committing an offense against God, by setting his eyes altogether upon Christ, and seeking no new thing or anything beside. And God might answer him after this manner, saying, If I have spoken all things to you in my word, which is my Son, and I have no other word, what answer can I now make to you? Or what can I reveal to you which is greater than this? Set your eyes on him alone, for in him I have spoken and revealed to you all things, and in him you shall find yet more than that which you ask and desire. For you ask locutions and revelations, which are the part. But if you set your eyes upon him, you shall find the whole, for he is my complete locution and answer, and he is all my vision and all my revelation, so that I have spoken to you, answered you, declared to you, and revealed to you, in giving him to you as your brother, companion, and master, as ransom and prize. For since that day when I descended upon him with my spirit on Mount Tabor, saying, Hic est filius meus dilectus, in quo mihi bene complacui ipsum audite, which is to say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. I have left off all these manners of teaching and answering, and I have entrusted this to him. Hear him, for I have no more faith to reveal, neither have I any more things to declare. For if I spoke before aforetime, it was to promise Christ. And if they inquired of me, their inquiries were directed to petitions for Christ and expectancy concerning him, in whom they should find every good thing, as is now set forth in all the teaching of the evangelists and the apostles. But now, any who would inquire of me after that manner, and desire me to speak to him or reveal anything to him, would, in a sense, be asking me for Christ again, and asking me for more faith, and be lacking in faith which has already been given in Christ. And therefore he would be committing a great offense against my beloved Son. For not only would he be lacking in faith, but he would be obliging him again, first of all, to become incarnate and pass through life and death. You shall find nothing to ask me or to desire of me, whether revelations or visions. Consider this well, for you shall find that all has been done for you, and all has been given to you, yea, and much more also, in him. If you desire me to answer you with any word of consolation, consider my son, who is subject to me and bound by love of me, and afflicted, and you shall see how fully he answers you. If you desire me to expound to you secret things or happenings, set your eyes on him alone, and you shall find the most secret mysteries and the wisdom and wondrous things of God which are hidden in him, even as my apostle says, In quo sunt omnes tesari sapientiae et scientiae dei absconditi. That is, in this Son of God are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge of God. These treasures of wisdom shall be very much more sublime and delectable and profitable for you than those things that you desired to know. 
herein the same apostle gloried, saying that he had not declared to them that he knew anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if you should still desire other divine or bodily revelations and visions, look also at him made man, and you shall find therein more than you think. For the apostle says likewise, In ipso habitat omnis plenitudo divinitatis corporaliter, which signifies, In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It is not fitting, then, to inquire of God by supernatural means, nor is it necessary that he should answer, since all the faith has been given us in Christ, and there is therefore no more of it to be revealed, nor will there ever be. And he that now desires to receive anything in a supernatural manner, as we have said, is, as it were, finding fault with God for not having given us a complete sufficiency in his Son. For although such a person may be assuming the faith and believing it, nevertheless he is showing a curiosity which belongs to faithlessness. We must not expect then to receive instruction or anything else in a supernatural manner. For at the moment when Christ gave up the ghost upon the cross, saying, Consumatum est, which signifies, It is finished, and end was made not only of all these forms, but also of all those other ceremonies and rites of the old law. And so we must now be guided in all things of the law, oh, by the law of Christ made man, and by that of his church and of his ministers, in a human and visible manner. And by these means we must remedy our spiritual weaknesses and ignorances, since in these means we shall find abundant medicine for them all. If we leave this path, we are guilty not only of curiosity, but of great audacity. Nothing is to be believed in a supernatural way, save only that which is the teaching of Christ made man. As I say, and of his ministers, who are men. So much so that St. Paul says these words, Quod si angelus de celo evangelizaverit, pater quam quod evangelizam vimus vobis, anathema sit. That is to say, if any angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we men preach unto you, let him be accursed and excommunicate. Wherefore, since it is true that we must ever be guided by that which Christ taught us, and that all things else are as nothing, and are not to be believed unless they are in conformity with it, he who still desires to commune with God after the manner of the old law acts vainly, Furthermore, it was not lawful at that time for everyone to inquire of God, neither did God answer all men, but only the priests and prophets from whose mouths it was that the people had to learn law and doctrine. And thus, if a man desired to know anything of God, he inquired of him through the prophet or the priest, and not of God himself. And if David inquired of God at certain times upon his own account, he did this because he was a prophet. And yet even so he did it not without the priestly vestment, as is clear was the case in the first book of the Kings, where he said to Abimelech the priest, Applica ad me ephod, which ephod was one of the priestly vestments, having which he then spoke with God. But at other times he spoke with God through the prophet Nathan and other prophets. And by the mouths of these prophets and of the priests, men were to believe that that which was said to them came from God. They were not to believe it because of their own opinions. And thus men were not in authorized or empowered at that time to give entire credence to what was said by God, unless it were approved by the mouths of priests and prophets. For God is so desirous that the government and direction of every man should be undertaken by another man like himself, 
and that every man should be ruled and governed by natural reason, that he earnestly desires us not to give entire credence to the things that he communicates to us supernaturally, nor to consider them as being securely and completely confirmed until they pass through this human aqueduct of the mouth of man. And thus, whenever he says or reveals something to a soul, he gives this same soul to whom he says it a kind of inclination to tell it to the person to whom it is fitting that it should be told. Until this has been done, it is not wont to give entire satisfaction, because the man has not taken it from another man like himself. We see in the book of the Judges that the same thing happened to the captain Gideon, to whom God had said many times that he should conquer the Midianites. Yet he was fearful and full of doubts, for God had allowed him to retain that weakness, until he heard from the mouth of men what God had said to him. And it came to pass that when God saw that he was weak, he said to him, Rise up and go down to the camp. Et cum audieris quid loquantur tunc confortabuntur manus tue, et sucurior ad hostium castra descendes. That is, when thou shalt hear what men are saying there, then shalt thou receive strength in that which I have said to thee, and thou shalt go down with greater security to the hosts of the enemy. And so it came to pass, that having heard a dream related by one of the Midianites to another, wherein the Midianite had dreamed that Gideon should conquer them, Gideon was greatly strengthened and began to prepare for the battle with great joy. From this it can be seen that God desired not that he should feel secure, since he gave him not the assurance by supernatural means alone, but caused him first to be strengthened by natural means. And even more surprising is the thing that happened in this connection to Moses, when God had commanded him and given him many instructions, which he continued with the signs of the wand changed into the, a serpent, and of the leprous hand, enjoining him to go and set free the children of Israel. So weak was he and so uncertain about this going forward, that although God was angered, he had not the courage to summon up the complete faith necessary for going, until God encouraged him through his brother Aaron, saying, Aaron frater tuus levites, shio quod eloquent sit, ecce ipse egredietur in occursum tuum, videnscue te letabitur corde, loquere ad eum, en pone verba mea, in ore ye eius, et ego ero in ore tuo, et in ore ilius, etc. Which is as though he had said, I know that thy brother Aaron is an eloquent man. Behold, he will come forth to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad at heart. Speak to him, and tell him all my words, and I will be in your mouth and in his mouth, so that each of you shall believe that which is in the mouth of the other. Having heard these words, Moses at once took courage, in the hope of finding consolation in the counsel which his brother was to give him. For this is a characteristic of the humble soul, which dares not converse alone with God, neither can be completely satisfied with human counsel and guidance. And that this should be given to it is the will of God, for he draws near to those who come together to converse of truth, in order to expound and confirm it in them, upon a foundation of natural reason. Even as he said that he would do when Moses and Aaron should come together, namely that he would be in the mouth of the one and in the mouth of the other. Wherefore he said likewise in the gospel that ubi fuerint duo vel tres congregate, congregati in nomine meo, ibi sum ego in medio eorum. That is, where two or three have come together, in order to consider that which is for the greater honor and glory of my name, there I am in the midst of them. That is to say, I will make clear and confirm in their hearts the truths of God. And it is to be observed that he said not, where there is one alone, 
there will I be, but where there are at least two. In this way he showed that God desires not that any man by himself alone should believe his experiences to be of God, or should act in conformity with them or rely upon them, but rather should believe the church in her ministers, for God will not make clear and confirm the truth in the heart of one who is alone, and thus such a one will be weak and cold. Hence comes that whereon the preacher insists, where he says, Vae soli quia cum cecirerit non habet sublevantem te se, si dormierunt de duo, fovebuntur mutuo, unus quomodo calefiet, et si quispiam prevalueret contra unum duo resistent ei, which signifies, Woe to the man that is alone, for when he falls he has none to raise him up. If two sleep together, the one shall give warmth to the other, that is to say, with the warmth of God who is between them. But one alone, how shall he be warm? That is to say, how shall he be other than cold as to the things of God? And if any man can fight and prevail against one enemy, that is the devil, who can fight and prevail against those that are alone and desire to be alone as regards the things of God, two men together will resist him, that is, the disciple and the master who come together to know and do the truth. And until this happens, such a man is habitually weak and feeble in the truth, however often he may have heard it from God, so much so that, despite the many occasions on which St. Paul preached the gospel, which he said that he had heard not of men, but from God, he could not be satisfied until he had gone to consult with St. Peter and the apostles, saying, Ne forte in vacuum curerem, aut cucurissem, which signifies, perchance he should run, or had run, in vain, having no assurance of himself until man had given him assurance. This, this seems a noteworthy thing, O Paul, that he who revealed to thee this gospel could not likewise reveal to thee the assurance of the faith which thou might have the fault which thou might have committed in preaching the truth concerning him. Herein it is clearly shown that a man must not rely upon the things that God reveals save in the way that we are describing. For even in cases where a person is in possession of certainty, as St. Paul was certain of his gospel, since he had already begun to preach it, yet although the revelation be of God, man may still err with respect to it, or in things relating to it. For although God reveals one thing, he reveals not always the other, and oftentimes he reveals something without revealing the way in which it is to be done. For ordinarily he neither performs nor reveals anything that can be accomplished by human counsel and effort, although he may commune with the soul for a long time, very lovingly. Of this St. Paul was very well aware, since as we say, although he knew that the gospel was revealed to him by God, he went to take counsel with St. Peter. And we see this clearly in the book of Exodus, where God had communed most familiarly with Moses, yet had never given him that salutary counsel which was given him by his father-in-law Jethro. That is to say that he should choose other judges to assist him, so that the people should not be waiting from morning till night. This counsel God approved, though it was not God who had given it to him, for it was a thing that fell within the limits of human judgment and reason. With respect to divine visions and revelations and locutions, God is not wont to reveal them, for he is ever desirous that men should make such use of their own reason as is possible. And all such things have to be governed by reason, save those that are of faith, which transcend all judgment and reason, although these are not contrary to faith. Wherefore, let none think that because it may be true that God and the saints commune with him familiarly about many things, they will of necessity explain to him the faults that he commits with regard to anything 
if it be possible for him to recognize these faults by other means. He can have no assurance about this, for as we read came to pass in the Acts of the Apostles, St. Peter, though a prince of the church, who was taught directly by God, went astray nevertheless with respect to a certain ceremony that was in use among the Gentiles, and God was silent. So far did he stray that St. Paul reproved him, as he affirms, saying, Cum vidissim, quod non recte ad veritatem evangelii ambularent, dixicoram omnibus, si tu judaeus cum sis gentiliter vivis, quomodo gentes cogis judaizare, which signifies, when I saw, says St. Paul, that the disciples walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew as you are, live after the manner of the Gentiles, how can you feign to force the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And God reproved not St. Peter himself for this fault, for that stimulation was a thing that had to do with reason, and it was possible for Peter to know it by rational means. Wherefore, on the day of judgment, God will punish for their many faults and sins many souls with whom he may quite habitually have held converse here below, and to whom he may have given much light and virtue. For as to those things that they have known that they ought to do, they have been neglectful, and have relied upon that converse they have with God and upon the virtue he has given them. And thus, as Christ says in the Gospel, they will marvel at that time, saying, Domine, Domine, none in nomine tuo profitavimus, et in nomine tuo demonia eiesimus, et in nomine tuo virtutes multas fecimus. That is, Lord, Lord, were the prophecy that, that you spoke to us perchance not prophecies in your name and in your name did we not cast out devils and in your name did we not perform many miracles and mighty works and the lord says that he will answer them in these words et tunc confitebor ilis qui enum quam novi vos discedite a me omnes qui operamini iniquitatem that is to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Of the number of these was the prophet Balaam and others like him, who, though God spoke with them and gave them thanks, were sinners. But the Lord will likewise give their proportion of reproof to his friends and chosen ones with whom he communed familiarly here below as to the faults and sins of neglect that they may have committed, whereof there was no need that God should himself warn them, since he had already warned them through the natural reason and law that he had given them. In concluding this part of my subject, therefore, I say, and I infer from what has already been said, that anything of whatsoever kind received by the soul through supernatural means most clearly, must clearly and plainly, fully and simply, be at once communicated to the spiritual director. For although there may seem no reason to speak of it, or to spend time upon doing so, since the soul is acting safely, as we have said, if it rejects it, and neither pays heed to it nor desires it, especially if it be a question of visions or revelations or other supernatural communications, which are either quite clear or very nearly so. Nevertheless, it is very necessary to give an account of all these, although it may seem to the soul that there is no reason for doing so. And this for three causes. First, as because as we have said, God communicates many things. The effect, power, light, and certainty whereof he confirms not wholly in the soul, until, as we have said, the soul consults him whom God has given to it as a spiritual judge, which is he that has the power to bind or loose, and to approve or blame, as we have shown by means of the passages quoted above. 
and we can show it clearly by experience. For we see humble souls to whom these things come to pass, and who after discussing them with the proper persons, experience a new satisfaction, power, light, and certainty. So much so that to some it seems that they have no effect upon them, nor do they even belong to them, until they have communicated them to the director whereupon they are given to them anew. The second cause is that the soul habitually needs instruction upon the things that come to pass within it, so that it may be led by that means to spiritual poverty and detachment, which is the dark night. For if it begins to relinquish this instruction, even when it desires not the things referred to, it will gradually, without realizing it, become callous as it treads the spiritual road, and draw near again to the road of sense. And it is partly with respect to this that these distinct things happen. The third cause is that, for the sake of the humility and submission and mortification of the soul, it is well to relate everything to the director, even though he make no account of it all, and consider it as of no importance. There are some souls who greatly dislike speaking of such things, because they think them to be unimportant, and know not how the person to whom they should relate them will receive them. But this is lack of humility, and for that very reason it is needful for them to submit themselves and relate these things. And there are others who are very timid in relating them, because they see no reason why they should have these experiences which seem to belong to saints, as well as other things which they are sorry to have to describe, for which cause they think there is no reason to speak of them, because they make no account of them. But for this very reason it is well for them to mortify themselves and relate them, until in time they come to speak of them humbly, unaffectedly, submissively, and readily. And after this they will always find it easy to do so. But with respect to what has been said, it must be pointed out that, although we have insisted so much that such things should be set aside, and that confessors should not encourage their penitents to discuss them, it is not well that spiritual fathers should show displeasure in regard to them, or should seek to avoid speaking of them, or despise them, or make their penitents reserved and afraid to mention them for it would be the means of causing them many inconveniences if the door were closed upon their relating them. For since they are a means and manner whereby God guides such souls, there is no reason for thinking ill of them or for being alarmed or scandalized by them, but rather there is reason for proceeding very quietly and kindly, for encouraging these souls and giving them an opportunity to speak of these things. If necessary, they must be exhorted to speak, and in view of the difficulty that some souls experience in describing such matters, this is sometimes quite essential. Let confessors direct their penitents into faith, advising them frankly to turn away their eyes from all such things, teaching them how to void the desire and the spirit of them, so that they may make progress and giving them to understand how much more precious in God's sight is one work or act of the will performed in charity than are all the visions and communications that they may receive from heaven, since these imply neither merit nor demerit. Let them point out, too, that many souls who have known nothing of such things have made incomparably greater progress than others who have received many of them. End of chapter 22